been showing prop, um, promptly. Uh, we had a few hiccups with uh, some technology stuff. There was a, uh, we got fried about 15 minutes ago, so that's what we've been working on to, uh, to correct. Uh, I want to welcome Administrator Jackson and thank her for making herself available to testify today on the EPA's fiscal year 2012 budget proposal. Getting control of the debt crisis our government faces starts with making funding authoriz authorizations not just relevant but integral to the budget process. As an authorizing committee, it is necessary that we analyze and question the details of where our tax dollars go in those agencies under our jurisdiction. Only then can we make appropriate decisions on where changes need to be made. Through the leadership of Chairman Upton, this committee will do its part to rein in wasteful and redundant federal spending. We will not only identify what programs should be eliminated, but we will also carefully question whether some programs considered to be worthwhile can and should live with less. The reality is we're out of money to spend. The American public understands this, and they're tasking us with the job of trimming the fat. While the proposed budget does represent a decrease from last year, it still spends $2 billion more than just a few years back under the previous administration. We can and must do better. By working together to focus EPA's budget on its core competency, I believe we can and will do better. This will mean making tough decisions in some cases. These decisions are made easier when we put them in perspective of what our deficit and debt mean to the economy. There is no better way to promote Americans' resurgence than providing a common sense regulatory climate that fosters certainty and eliminates unnecessary and burdensome regulations. Many regulations can have devastating impacts on industries, wasting millions in public and private dollars in the process. One example is the greenhouse gas rules rejected by the last Congress in no small part because of the uncertainty they create. This uncertainty ultimately stifles job creation and energy expansion. Yet the administration has moved forward on this rule, seeking nearly $100 million in fiscal year 12 to do so. As we found in last month's hearing on regulation jobs in the economy, it doesn't have to be one broad regulation to wreak havoc on the economy. Small business owners regularly find themselves subject to an increasing number of overly burdensome regulations. Without the expertise or staff to navigate through the mandates, costs for entrepreneurs skyrocket, leaving little capital left for expansion and new hires. Less money to spend demand, demands we make every effort to get back to basics. We need to understand every new program that EPA proposes. We need to see if that program will place or repackage old policy. We need to justify programs based on the severity of the national need. And we need to identify and understand the progress programs have made based upon measurable criteria and whether EPA can justify their continuation. This will be no easy task, but I look forward to open, sincere dialogue with the agency. It is my intention to work together to give the EPA the tools it needs to carry out its job in a manner that benefits the environment, the economy, and the American taxpayer without unnecessarily burdens, burdens and wasteful spending. And with that, I'd like to yield one minute to my colleague from uh, Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Chimkus and uh, Administrator Jackson. We appreciate your being here with us today and giving us the opportunity to visit with you about the EPA budget and certainly want, want to have some discussion also about the President's January 2011 executive order about uh, promoting economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, competitiveness and job creation uh, through, and the impact that regulations have on that. And so we look forward to your testimony today and we appreciate your being here. And now I'd like to uh, uh, recognize Mr. Murphy for the remainder of my time, which should be about a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly a question we have to deal with today is how do we pay for all these things? To clean up our water, which we want, to clean up our brownfields, which we want, and to clean our air. But I'm hoping we come up with, with more creative solutions than the past issue of carbon credits, which I liken to Seinfeld credits. The famous Seinfeld show, a show about nothing, is likened to this because when you are trading a carbon credit, you're basically asking a company that produces something in a smokestack to trade it on a commodity for a smokestack, that maybe no smokestack, that produces nothing. But these paper carbon credits will be traded in the market in such a way it will increase the cost of electricity, increase the cost of manufacturing, send more jobs overseas, and have no net impact upon air pollution, which floats back over here. 
I dearly hope that we will come up with solutions and means to pay for those because we all on both sides of the aisle want a cleaner environment, but we also want jobs to function for these things. And I'm hoping that's a key part of today's discussion and look forward to these hearings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Now the chair recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding a hearing today on the FY12 EPA budget. I want to thank Administrator Jackson for appearing before the committee again, and I know you've been before our committee several times in the past few weeks. And as a side, I was wondering if you have the rights to assign your parking place when you're not using it to any other member. Uh, but I appreciate you making time to discuss the uh, EPA budget with us today. As a member who represents an energy producing district, I understand the balance must be struck between clean and safe energy production in our environment. The EPA serves the important function of monitoring our environmental health and safety. The public health protections they provide are very important in our local communities. Today we're discussing the budget. Last week I was at a hearing for the Health and Human Services budget and across the board we're making reductions in spending to get the budget under control. Uh, EPA's budget is no exception. Reductions in funding have reflect, been reflected in the President's budget. I have several concerns about what the I have with that budget proposal, mostly within the area of Superfund accounts. Uh, Congressman Ted Poe and I have a Superfund site that we share in our districts, which is leaking dioxin. The EPA is pursuing the responsible parties, but cuts within the budget make it difficult for EPA to pursue responsible parties and to clean up the Superfund sites already on the national priorities list. This is extremely disconcerting because I know from this experience we had with our Superfund site how hard it is for EPA to list the sites, to add them to the NPL and actually begin cleaning them up because the Superfund program already lacks funds. I'm pleased the budget adds in funds for the e-waste recycling programs. I've been working on e electronic waste recycling legislation for several years and I strongly believe the United States needs uh, not only as a national but a global responsibility to set up a national e-waste recycling standards. And again, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Administrator, for appearing before the committee today and look forward to hearing your testimony. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. A gentleman yields back his time. A chair recognizes that all members will have a uh, uh, unanimous consent request for their opening statements to be placed into the record. The chair now recognizes the chairman emeritus, uh, Chairman Barton, for five minutes. For five minutes? If you want it. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm going to yield back some of that time, Mr. Good. Chairman. I'm, um, I'm used to one minute or two minutes. Uh, we want to welcome uh, Administrator Jackson again. We're going to have a good dialogue with her. I want the record to show that myself and I think every Republican on this sub subcommittees, joint subcommittees, support a strong EPA and we support strong enforcement of our environmental laws. What we don't support is an EPA that goes beyond its core mission uh, for what I consider to be political purposes or pursues strategies that uh, uh, cost extremely much more than they do result in, in benefits. One of the ways the Congress has the authority to uh, review any agency is to review its budget authority, uh, and that's the purpose of this hearing. Uh, even with the reduction from last year's spending level, uh, the EPA is requesting over $9 billion. Uh, that's a lot of money, and uh, I am looking forward to uh, asking some very um, serious questions about where that money's being spent and how it's being spent and what the results of that uh, that spending is so with that mr chairman i put my formal statement in the record and i yield back the or yield to whoever you wish to yield it to uh, the gentleman yields back his time the chair now recognizes the chairman emeritus mr waxman for five minutes very much uh, mr chairman today we'll compare two visions of EPA's budget, and the difference between them could not be more stark. The President's budget is fiscally responsible, yet gives the agency the resources it needs to protect public health and the environment. The Republican budget would decimate the agency and its public health mission. A common perce perception is that energy and environmental issues are more regional than partisan, and for most of my career that's been true. But that is no longer true today. The Republican Party in Congress has become the anti-environment party. There's no more telling proof than H.R. 1, the Republican budget proposal. 
the, uh, during the debates we've had in this committee on clean air in 1990, when we did our revisions, we had uh, Republicans who were clearly pro-environmental. President George H.W. Bush, representatives like Sherry Bollard, John Chafee, were close allies and true environmental champions. And ultimately, after difficult compromises, our regional bipartisan coalitions were able to rally around a bill that passed the House 401 to 25 and the Senate 89 to 10. But this kind of bipartisanship seems impossible today. Republicans in this Congress have an anti-environmental agenda. And as of yesterday's markup of the Upton Inhofe bill it demonstrates, they also have an anti-science agenda. It is a Republican mantra that they're pursuing the will of the people, but that's not what they're doing. Their anti-science, anti-environmental agenda may be the will of the Coke industry, but it is not what American families want. Americans know that their families' health and quality of life depend on a clean environment. They know we need a strong EPA to stop oil companies and power companies from poisoning our air and water. They know we need a strong EPA to keep toxic chemicals out of our food supply and away from our children. But instead of give, giving EPA the resources the agency needs, Republicans are using the budget process to handcuff the agency. The Republican mm -hmm. budget is the most sweeping and reckless assault on health and the environment that we have seen in decades. This bill slashed EPA's funding by almost a third, denying the agency the resources it needs to carry out the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe, Safe Drinking Water Act, the Food Quality Protection Act, and the Toxic Substances Control Act. Writers in H.R. 1 blocked EPA from regulating toxic emissions from cement plants. They defund EPA's effort to reduce dangerous carbon emissions. They, they sought to prevent EPA from protecting water quality in thousands of streams and wetlands, threatening drinking water supplies for millions of Americans. I'm glad we have Administrator Jackson here today. I look forward to her testimony. She will explain what the implications of the a Republican budget would be on her agency. I, I know it's awkward because we're going to hear from her after we've already voted on the House floor for some of these very, very damaging cuts and uh, un un unthought through writers. But I hope members will listen. In the weeks ahead, we have time to change course and work together to give EPA the resources it needs to protect public health and the environment. Yield back uh, the balance of my, well, let me. Are you going to yield separately to Mr. Rush? I wasn't, was hoping that you, you would. Well, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Rush. I want to thank the uh, ranking member for yielding the balance of his time, and I want to thank the uh, uh, chairman of the committee for holding uh, this hearing. And I certainly want to thank the uh, administrator uh, uh, for being here. Madam Administrator, uh, uh, I want to thank you and uh, for all your hard work on, and dedication on behalf of the American people to provide uh, all of us with clean air and water and, to, and for protecting the public health in spite of all the ridicule and contempt, contempt rather, that you have been encountering as you attempt to do the job that uh, President Obama tapped you to do. Uh, you're a woman of immense talents, courage, and commitment, and I want to congratulate you on your resolve and commend you on your resolve. The President's budget already proposes a 13% decrease to EPA's FY12 budget, and then uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are attempting to, to compound your challenges by proposing draconian cuts of almost a third of your budget compared to FY10 levels. And I, for one, uh, Madam Administrator, uh, can tell you that my constituents are very confused and perplexed that the same Republicans who will cut $3 billion from the agency charged with protecting the public health are also the same politicians who vehemently resist taking away the $3.6 billion in tax credit from oil companies who are making record profits, even as the average American struggle to pay uh, for $4 a, a gallon for gas uh, in most places in, in this nation. 
Some programs that are near and near to me will see significant funding cuts, including uh, a $550 million reduction to the drinking water state revolving and loan fund. Uh, I ask for unanimous consent for 30 seconds. A uh, gentleman is recognized for additional 30 uh, seconds without objection. Uh, Madam Administrator, I realize that with such deep funding cuts, you are forced to make some tough choices as you prioritize your agenda and work to protect uh, America's air and water supply. Uh, I want you to know that you have my, uh, uh, my support, my stellar support, and we intend to work very, very closely with you to work our way through this uh, issue uh, and these problems that we are confronted with uh, as a nation. Thank you so very much, and God bless. I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back this time. Now the chair welcomes the Honorable Lisa Jackson, Administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Ma'am, your entire record of uh, testimony has been recorded and on file. If you have five minutes for uh, an overview, and um, welcome again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chimkis, uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Members, Rush and Green, Members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testi testify about President Obama's budget request for the Environmental Protection Agency. I just want to start to say that our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Japan this morning, and uh, EPA, along with much of the federal government, stands ready to assist them and our own people as we see the ramifications of what's going on there. Congress enacted the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and America's other bedrock environmental protection laws on a broadly bipartisan basis. It did so to protect Americans' children and adults from pollution that otherwise would make their lives shorter, less healthy, and less prosperous. It did so to make the air and drinking water in America's communities clean enough to attract new employers. It did so to enable America's local governments to revitalize abandoned and polluted industrial sites. It did so to safeguard the pastime of America's 40 million anglers. It did so to protect the farms whose irrigation makes up a third of America's surface water, freshwater withdrawals. And it did so to preserve the livelihoods of fishermen in, in America's great waters, such as the Great Lakes, the Chesapeake Bay, and the Gulf of Mexico. Congress gave EPA the responsibility of implementing and enforcing those laws. Each year, Congress appropriates the money that makes EPA's implementation and enforcement work possible. As head of the EPA, I am accountable for squeezing every last drop of public health protection out of every dollar we are given. So I support the tough cuts in the President's proposed budget. But I am equally accountable for pointing out when cuts become detrimental to public health. Without adequate funding, EPA would be unable to implement or enforce the laws that protect Americans' health, livelihoods, and pastimes. Big polluters would flout legal restrictions on dumping contaminants into the air, into rivers, and onto the ground. Toxic plumes already underground would reach drinking water supplies because ongoing work to contain them would stop. There'd be no EPA grant money to fix or replace broken water treatment systems, and the standards EPA is set to establish for harmful air pollution from smokestacks and tailpipes would remain missing from a population of sources that is not static but growing. So if Congress slashes EPA funding, concentrations of harmful pollution would increase from current levels in the places Americans live, work, go to school, fish, hike, and hunt. The result would be more asthma attacks, more missed school days and work days, more heart attacks, more cancer cases, more premature deaths, and more polluted waters. Needless to say, then, I fervently request and deeply appreciate continued bipartisan support in Congress for funding the essential work that keeps American children and adults safe from uncontrolled amounts of harmful pollution being dumped into the water they drink and the air they breathe. Decreasing federal spending is no longer just a prudent choice. It is now an unavoidable necessity. Accordingly, President Obama has proposed to cut EPA's annual budget nearly 13 percent. That cut goes beyond eliminating redundancies. We have made difficult, even painful choices. We have done so, however, in a careful way that preserves abilities EPA, EPA's ability to carry out its core responsibilities for, to protect the health and well-being of Americans' children, adults, and communities. You've been reviewing the budget request for more than three weeks, so I'll save the de details for the question and answer period. Before turning to your questions, I will address Chairman Upton's bill to eliminate portions of the Clean Air Act. The most extreme parts of that bill remain unchanged since I testified about it a month ago. It still would presume to overrule the scientific community on the scientific finding that carbon pollution endangers Americans' health and well-being. Politicians overruling scientists on a scientific question. You might well be remembered more for that than for anything else you do. 
The bill still would block any Clean Air Act standards for greenhouse gas pollution from cars and trucks after 2016. Alone, the Department of Transportation's CAFE standards do not achieve nearly as much pollution reduction or oil savings as when they are backed up by the Clean Air Act's enforcement provisions. All told, nullifying this part of the Clean Air Act would forfeit many hundreds of millions of barrels of oil savings at a time when gas prices are rising yet again. I cannot for the life of me understand why you would vote to massively increase America's oil dependence. The Clean Air Act saves millions of American children and adults from the debilitating and expensive illnesses that occur when smokestacks and tailpipes dump unrestricted amounts of harmful pollution into the air we breathe. I respectfully ask this committee to think twice before gutting that landmark law. Thank you, Chairman. I look forward to your question. Thank you, Madam Ad Administrator. And uh, now I will recognize myself uh, for five minutes for the uh, first round of questions. Um, at as I do so, I will remind my colleagues that uh, the Republican budget hasn't been proposed yet. That's what we're doing um, next month. We are trying to uh, address the continuing resolution based upon the fact that the Democrats in the majority last Congress didn't pass a budget. Uh, had they done that, we wouldn't be in this CR fight. But, but that uh, did not happen. And Madam Administrator, uh, you know that uh, when we do propose our budget, you should expect to see, uh, constitutionally all appropriations begin in the House, you should expect to see 2008 budget numbers uh, come uh, for, uh, for the Environmental Protection Agency. And um, the point being, and the public understands that in 2008, we still spent a whole heck of a lot of money. So 2008 spending levels does not mean we're not spending any money. In fact, it means we're spending billions of dollars. And uh, I, I would um, just give you a heads up that the, your agency uh, should be prepared for those numbers uh, once we finish our budget process. Uh, having said that, I'd like to put uh, on the slide two uh, statements, one from the, uh, your agency and one from the President of the United States. Um, in 2010, June 2010, when you proposed your coal ash rule, it stated, the regulatory impact assessment for this proposal rule does not include either qualitative or quantitative estimation of the potential effects of the proposed rule on economic productivity, economic growth, employment, job creation, or international competitiveness. Now, the President issued an executive order in January 2011, and in that executive order, he states, and that's the second one, it's highlighted in red, that regulatory reform must take into account benefits and costs, both quantitative and qualitative, in the interest of economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation. Now, so the question, since the executive order says exactly the opposite of what you had previously stated during the rulemaking process, will you now go back and rescind the coal ash rule? The, the coal ash rule is not final, Mr. Chairman. It is. Uh, it has been proposed. It has been subject to over 400,000 comments. So on let me, uh, reclaiming my time, let me ask then, will you, since it has not been finalized, will you comply with the President's executive order and take into consideration both qualitative and a quantitative estimation of the potential effects of the proposed rule? W we, yes, of course we will. And let me simply say the proposed rule does have cost estimates in it. The, the piece that you uh, exempted from the RIA points out uh, estimates that weren't done, but there were several cost estimates done in conjunction. So you're agreeing now to make sure that the RI will comply with the President's executive order? A any final rule, when it is finalized, and we have not announced the date for that rule, has to comply with the President's executive order. Can you uh, outline any other regulations you will specifically uh, uh, reconsider based upon the President's executive order? Well, the President's executive order has uh, several parts. One is a retrospective look at regulations, which the agency is, uh, has already uh, begun in, in compliance with that order. So we will, in effect, be looking back at all of our regulations. That's what the executive order asks us to do. In addition, of course, it puts requirements on us prospectively as regulations are evaluated. Do you have a master plan for your look back, and would you provide a copy for the committee for that? Uh, we do not yet have it, sir, but we are working on it. I believe it's due to uh, the White House in about a month, and of course we'll provide it. 
Do you have any EPA regulations that you feel would be exempt from the presidential executive order? Uh, not to my knowledge, sir. I, I don't believe we've identified any exemptions. And what portion of the 2012 presidential budget uh, uh, is being used to carry out the president's executive order? Uh, I, I don't have a figure specifically for that work. It will be done in the base budget for EPA, and it will span several of the offices at EPA. Can you provide that for the committee? Um, we can certainly give an estimate of what we entail uh, the workload to do. So. That would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, um, my time is uh, nearly expired, so I'll now yield to my colleague from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, as you know, we have a short time, so I'll get into the questions. As you know, I personally have been very interested in the issue of electronic waste and I've been working on the issue. And I've noticed there are some individuals who believe the EPA should spend money to build capacity for managing e-waste in developing nations. While well, I agree that these countries do need to develop their capacity to manage their own e-waste, I think that we, if we do not address the e-waste problem domestically, then it will be just an excuse to continue exporting to developing countries. That's why I'm a little concerned with EPA's budget justification focus on EPA partnering with other nations and international organizations such as the UNEP to begin tracking the international movement of electronic waste and provide e-waste best practices through education and demonstration projects in developing countries. I think it's a little disingenuous for the United States to talk about capacity building in these countries if we haven't addressed the problem of our own e-waste exports. Uh, plus, given that we are in a world of diminishing EPA funding, we simply shouldn't be spending money on this internationally. Instead, the EPA should be spending time and money to increase responsible recycling here in the United States and increasing capacity and quality as well as legal compliance here at home. Several weeks ago at a hearing on environmental regulations and jobs, Wendy New of the New Corporation, an e-waste recycler, testified that the EPA regulations have added value to her business. If the EPA were focused on uh, focus all the budgeted amount currently designated for an international capacity building, education, demonstration projects, et cetera, on improving our domestic capacity uh, for quality of e-waste recycling, wouldn't we then actually be adding value to the business of our United States recyclers, allowing them to expand their own operations and add more jobs for U.S. workers so that any investment by the federal government and the EPA's budget on the front end would be more than paid for by the business expansion and job creation on the back end. I'm concerned that the focus on best practices overseas sets a precedent of ignoring our problem domestic and absolves us of our uh, responsibility to set up our own national e-waste program. Um, that's, a, that's a question that I would like to, do you think that uh, by focusing on international cooperation and education that we're actually short uh, sided in dealing with our own problems domestically? Well, they're not exclusive, sir. Um, we are doing uh, work domestically with several of the manufacturers and several of the states who have put in place their own regulations for e-waste recycling. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that one of the things we'll have to do if we want to create a market here is stop the illegal export of these uh, um, waste and the only way to do that is I w in the receiving country because they uh, have to come to understand how bad this is for them from the standpoint of public health. Well, with our, with our scarce dollars, my concern is we might not be doing what we need to do here and, and maybe, you know, helping developing countries. But let me go on. Um, on question, my second question is on e-manifest. In your budget proposal, you also request $2 million for the development of electronic hazardous waste manifest systems, or e-manifest. It's my understanding that the current uh, paper hazardous waste manifest system creates a very large administrative paperwork and as well as financial burden on firms regulated under RECWA uh, hazardous uh, waste provisions. Can you discuss the burden of the current hazardous waste manifest system creates for business as well as for the EPA? Well, well, certainly, uh, the $2 million investment is intended to uh, help to relieve some of that uh, burden. Uh, we're obviously in the electronic age. The idea is that electronic manifests uh, will uh, help reduce paperwork. Um, it does require some amount of training, but the, man the purpose of the manifest system, of course, is a cradle-to-grave understanding of where waste flows are uh, domestically in our country. So we believe it's an investment in modernizing the system that will pay off in efficiency later. One of the concerns I have, it seems like under our current system when we have it, that there should be potential savings, not only the EPA, but the, and, um, to businesses. There's excessive postal costs because you have to ship uh, for 
each, uh, each paper on the hazardous waste manifest. Uh, the budget proposal also discussed as a legislative proposal the EPA will submit to Congress on the collection of user fees to support the development of operation uh, of the E-manifest system. For several years, legislation has been introduced in both House and the Senate to create an E-manifest system funded by user fees. Legislation has not been introduced this year, and I'd be interested in seeing EPA's proposal and if do you anticipate sending it to Congress. We are happy to send uh, technical information and uh, 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 support for uh, such a proposal. So. My last, uh, the EPA is expected in 2012 to finalize a rule to allow for the electronic tracking of hazardous waste using the e-manifest. Will these rules be issued before or after the legislative proposal is sent to Congress? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head, Mr. Green. Let me, let me find out because we're okay. talking about, I, I think the intent of the budget was to show that we have a full proposal. This $2 million investment would eventually rely on rules that implement the e-manifest system. But uh, we'll, we'll get a schedule for okay, you. Okay, appreciate the information. Thank you, Mr. Green. Gentleman's time expired. Chair now recognizes the subcommittee chairman for energy and power, Mr. Whitfield, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chim, because um, I want to further explore a question that Mr. Shimkus had. In addition to the your fly ash rule in June of 2010, in December of 2010, you issued guidelines for preparing economic uh, analysis. And in that guideline, it said regulatory induced employment impacts are not generally relevant for a cost benefit analysis. And I think that guideline would have also be in direct conflict with the president's executive order. And I, so I would ask you, are you revising the guidelines at all? I, I believe the guidelines call for um, a separate jobs analysis or envision a separate jobs analysis. So I think what the intent was was not to double count jobs analysis in the, ec in the cost benefit, but happy to take a look at that issue to make sure. But in, no but in your guidelines now you do insist that you look at the impact on jobs of any regulations? We are doing jobs analysis for our regulations, yes, sir. And that, w now, let me, uh, second question I would like to ask you uh, is, uh, do you know how many lawsuits are pending against EPA today? How many lawsuits? I do not have the number, sir, but. Would you be able to get that to us? Certainly, certainly. Uh, because I noticed that the legal advice part of your budget exceeds $61 million, which is quite a bit of money. Well, well we are sued quite often, sir, by, by many sides. And uh, uh, also, how much money do we, does EPA contribute to the uh, International Panel on Climate Change? Um, do we, I don't know that we, uh, sir, I'll have to get that number for you for the record. I'm not sure that we do contribute, but if we do, I'll get that number to you. So there, uh, we, maybe we don't contribute any money to it through EPA? Yeah, uh, we do not know, so rather than give you an accurate okay. information, may I please just get it? Okay. Now, uh, I noticed that in the budget there's also about $1.2 billion set aside for categorical grants. And I noticed that categorical grants can also be given to nonprofit uh, groups. Would you be able to give me three or four names of some nonprofit groups that have received these categorical grants? Um, well, I know just because I saw a letter recently from, uh, uh, I believe it's Chairman Upton, that there's a request for the entire list. I happen to see another piece of correspondence from the state of California. Many of their local and regional air boards receive uh, those grants. So uh, I think you'll see a mixture of uh, <coughs> state and public entities, uh, as well as possibly some NGOs, but we are working on the response to that letter. So, so we'll you'll be providing a total list of those and the amounts and. That, that's what the letter requests, okay. sir, and uh, it's a fairly substantial piece of work. But that is what we're in the process of doing. Thank you. Now I noticed that there's also like 195 million dollars in civil and criminal enforcements. Does, are we primarily talking about? Uh, court action to enforce compliance with EPA rules? Is that what that $195 million basically would go for? Many of our actions are administrative, sir, so they never reach the courts. Uh, they are administrative actions, penalty actions, and other. Civil enforcement can be 
uh, obviously under civil codes uh, uh, can result in indictments and uh, fines, penalties, or even jail time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, my time is about to conclude here, I, I, so I want to just go back once more because this job impact issue is so important in my view. Uh, I just want to make sure in the guidelines you're saying that in some instances you do look at uh, job impacts, is that correct? We, we have been looking at jobs impacts analysis as part of our regulatory analyses and uh, if you look at any of the uh, rulemaking records for recent rules, certainly ones uh, I've been uh, involved with, there are jobs analysis if they're economically significant rules. And, and would, could you say that on just about on every regulation that's going to be issued at EPA now, job analysis impacts will be looked at? Well, I think we need to look at economically significant regulations. EPA has several regulations that don't rise to that. Right, economically significant, that would be what, 100 million or more, or what is the? That, that is uh, one of the tiers that we look at, yes, or 100 million or more. But wh why don't I give you the criteria by which we do the jobs analysis? I'm happy to do that. I agree with you that uh, we need to do as good a job we can looking at the jobs impacts of major rules. Thank you. Gentleman yields back his time. Chair now recognizes the Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Waxman, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Administrator Jackson, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you're here today. It gives you the opportunity to set the record straight on several matters. Yesterday, the Subcommittee on Energy and Power marked up the Upton Inhofe Bill to eliminate EPA's authority to address carbon pollution and climate change. During the markup, Chairman Upton said, that EPA's greenhouse gas regulations would increase gasoline prices. His reasoning was based on a quote you gave in 2009 when you said congressional action on energy and climate legislation would be more effective and less costly than EPA regulation. Now, we're likely to hear that same claim next week when the full committee meets to consider the bill. Administrator Jackson, can you tell us whether Chairman Upton is accurate in his description of your views? No, sir, he is not. And how is he inaccurate? Well, it, it's actually the, um, the opposite of the truth. The bill, the, the bill that uh, passed the committee would actually increase the amount of money that Americans have to pay for gasoline, uh, diesel. It would increase our oil dependence by hundreds of millions of barrels. It would do so. Um, by blocking EPA's common sense steps under the Clean Air Act on vehicle standards because that bill, although it recognizes past standards, undoes the endangerment finding on which those standards are based and then uh, takes EPA out of the process for years 2016 and beyond. So all those hundreds of millions of bar barrels of oil savings, which come directly from the Clean Air Act's enforcement provisions, uh, would be forfeited. So it's rather Orwellian. Uh, you have regulations dealing with motor vehicles that uh, reduce the requirement that they use, reduce the re their need to use uh, as much gasoline as otherwise would be the case. And they would wipe out those regulations, potentially, we think they would, uh, which would mean we'd be using more oil. And if uh, consumers are using more oil, that's going to drive up the price than if they're using less oil. Isn't that correct? Right. There is the, the Americans' demand for oil is down, uh, and one of the reasons is, I think, because vehicles are becoming more efficient. That's been stated many times. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the best argument that Chairman Upton can make for his bill, I, I think he's truly uh, grasping at straws. I want to ask you about H.R. 1, the Republican funding bill. Uh, my concern is that the Republican bu budget uh, would amount to a devastating assault on public health and the environment. How would H.R. 1, if it became law, affect EPA's ability to protect the public? Well, it, it, as was mentioned earlier, sir, um, that uh, um, bill uh, cuts EPA's budget overall by 30 percent on the top line. Those, that is a uh, fairly dramatic cut. I say that mindful of the fact that the President's proposed budget cuts EPA 13 percent from the top line. Uh, so those cuts, uh, we understand that cuts have to happen, but it's part of my job to say that the core programs that EPA implements through the states, uh, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, are proven public health providers. They uh, reduce uh, premature deaths, they reduce asthma attacks, they 
uh, uh, reduce cancer incidences, and uh, that, that's one of our concerns. Of course, the riders are another matter. There are several riders uh, on that bill that uh, tie EPA's hands in a variety of Well, I want to ask you about one of th those riders. It would prevent you from regulating toxic emissions like mercury from cement plants. What would be the effect of this provision on uh, public health? Actually, that rider prevents us from uh, enforcing or even providing assistance to cement manufacturers to deal with a rule that is right now on the books. That, that rule was intended to reduce mercury, cadmium, other metals uh, that come from the emissions from cement manufacturing. And it is based on usable and doable and financially affordable technology. Uh, and what would happen is that EPA would not be able to enforce it or uh, at all, so there'd be uneven enforcement uh, and potentially confusion in the regulated community, uh, which could result in higher emissions. Uh, and later on, at some point, we'd, we'd have to come back and face the accounting for that. Well, how much concern should people have about uh, mercury and cadmium and uh, these other emissions from these, uh, uh, from these cement plants? Well, mercury is a neurotoxin as well as a carcinogen. The rule was estimated to reduce uh, mercury emissions from cement plants by uh, 92 percent. So you would lose potentially some or uh, uh, much of that uh, if you're not enforcing the rule. Uh, particulate matter, which is a killer, 11,500 tons, a uh, 92 percent reduction under the rule. What do mercury emissions do to children? Mercury is a neurotoxin. It's toxic to brain development. And so as our children's brains are developing and uh, as they're in the womb, fetus development as well, it can be quite toxic and can cause uh, uh, developmental or uh, uh, other impacts. Well, Administrator Jackson, you have a critically important job. Your regulations keep kids out of the emergency room, avoid birth defects in babies, prevent cancers that can devastate families. And I would hope that uh, as we think through what your budget should be, uh, that we don't uh, end up uh, keeping you from doing this very important job uh, and, uh, and block the essential regulations or gut the Clean Air Act. I don't think that's what the American people want. And uh, if they find out that's what's happening, I'm sure they're going to be very, very angry. Yield back my time. Chairman, uh, Chairman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes Chairman Emeritus Barton for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my state uh, is in Region 6 of EPA, and I think, as you know, uh, last summer, EPA went in and preempted the state's flexible air quality permitting system that had been in place since 1993 and revoked in the neighborhood of 150 to 175 uh, existing clean air permits. Uh, could you give the committee the um, budgetary impact of the EPA having to take over those programs for the state, for the record? Well, yes, certainly EPA is All right. now. Just will you get that? I don't expect oh, you, you to have it on the top of your head, just if you could get it to us. And could you also get us what the Region 6 budget is for the current fiscal year, please? Certainly. Okay. Um, last year, as ranking member Congressman Burgess and I sent letters to you uh, asking for your authority under Title 42, which is a program that was established by the Department of Health and Human Services to get um, uh, extra salary for employees uh, in special cases, uh, we can't tell that there was any authority to use this program at the EPA. Um, we got back a fairly uh, murky letter in response. Could you now please submit for the record uh, the authority that EPA has to use Title 42 and how many employees uh, currently are paid under this Title 42. This, would, this allows uh, the Health and Human Service to hire doctors and people like that that are above the uh, SES pay grade. Could you do that? Yes, sir. Thank you. So far, you're doing great. <laughs> Every question I have. <laughs> All right. Now, it's just, they get a little bit murkier now terms of questions I'm asking. I have heard you and others repeatedly talk about the number of lives saved because of the Clean Air Act uh, and other environmental laws. I voted for the Clean Air Act amendments, and I said in my opening statement I support, support strong enforcement of the Clean Air Act. I have never seen an analysis, however, of where you get those numbers about lives saved and things like that. Can you provide that analysis for the record for the committee? 
Happy to. Those are peer-reviewed analysis. Be happy to provide them. So. All right. Um, you used in your opening statement the term carbon pollution. Um, would you care to define that briefly? Sure. It's carbon pollution is shorthand for carbon dioxide pollution. It's meant to cover the class of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide being the one that's most uh, uh, highest volume. So you, you're just trying to use a shorthand version of CO2 or carbon dioxide. My good friend Mr. Inslee yesterday used the term black carbon pollution, which refers to particulate matter. Um, the table in front of you is made of carbon. If you if you had a diamond in your wedding ring, it would be made of carbon. Carbon itself is not obviously a, a pollutant, and I would hope that the uh, administrator of the EPA would um, would be more precise, especially since you have a chemical, I believe a chemical engineering degree. If anybody should know what greenhouse gases are, I'm, I'm looking at her right now. Well, uh, let me qualify. Black carbon soot is in and of itself a, a, a pollutant. There are and many I naturally occurring substances that are not good for you, arsenic being one that we can talk about, mercury we just did. So. All right, let's talk about mercury. My good friend Mr. Waxman asked about mercury. What's, are you going to be more exposed to mercury if a CFL breaks in your home or from um, the trace elements of mercury that come out of a smokestack of a power plant. Which is the largest exposure? I have not seen a comparison of CS CFLs. If you're asking me whether CFLs have trace amounts of mercury, they certainly do. There are tons and tons of mercury emissions that come from power plants. So You might want to check your record on that. The, the amount of mercury that comes out of a power plant stack at a given power plant is in pounds per year, not tons per year. No. Well, I, I was speaking even, I, cumulatively, I, sir, across the country, but I I'm would. I'm talking on an annual basis, okay? Tons is a misnomer when used with mercury. Uh, you know, now you're, you're an engineer, okay? Uh, uh, the metrics matter. Metrics matter. You, we can talk tons of CO2. We can do that. But in terms of mercury, trace elements come out of a power plant stack, and it's not tons per year. It's, it's pounds per year per, per plant. Per plant, yes, sir. But if you aggregate them and add them up, you get pounds, and 2,000 pounds equal a ton. That's true. <laughs> I'll stipulate it. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time is expiring and expired. Chair now recognizes Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Dingle for five minutes. For your courtesy, and I commend you for this hearing. Uh, Madam Administrator, welcome to the committee. Uh, I am very much concerned about the President's budget request. I am very much concerned about the Great Lakes and about the severe issues of pollution and restoration and invasive species. And I'm noting that it, this gets a 20% cut in this year's budget proposal. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative coordinates efforts to re remediate contamination, reduce ongoing pollution, and lessen the impact of invasive species in this place, which is 20% of the world's fresh water. I am very much concerned, however, that HR1 the spending proposal for HR, rather for 2011, would cut the spending in this program for $225 million. And I have seen on a number of occasions, including when, when Mr. Levitt was in Michigan, that he was up to announce what a great job he was doing, when in point of fact, he was coming up to announce cuts in this particular program. Can your agency meet its obligation uh, to the Great Lakes and to our people up there who depend on this resource with the funding levels contained in H.R. 1, yes or no? The, the cuts in H.R. 1 are $225 million, you said, sir? I'm sorry? I, I, I couldn't hear. The cuts to, in H.R. 1 to the Great Lakes are $225 million? $225 million, is it? Yeah. 
So that, yeah, my, in my opinion, the President's budget recommended less cuts because we believed we needed more money in the Great Lakes. So can you meet your re responsibilities, yes or no? No, not, not, uh, not to the extent that we think we should, and that's why we didn't propose. And that. remember that the Great Lakes are a geological institution, one which has been there since for about 10,000 years. Uh, now, what are the, will be the practical impact of these cuts on the Great Lakes? If you wish, you may submit that to the uh, committee in writing for insertion in the record. According to its most recent report, I would note that with regard to uh, drinking water infrastructure needs, EPA estimates that $334.8 billion is needed to ensure public health and economic well-being for our cities, towns, and communities. That report is based on 2007. Have the needs in drinking water infrastructure increased or decreased since 2007? I, I would imagine they have increased, sir. All right. Uh, and would you submit to us also, please, the real number now, because the $225 uh, billion dollar number is uh, dated 2007. I note that H.R. 1, the spending proposal passed by the House, cuts safe drinking water uh, ro rotating fund from $1.387 billion to $830 million. Would you state for us the, the impact of these cuts? I assume they cannot be beneficial. No, sir, that money is used to spend uh, uh, in, in communities large and small to invest in sewage treatment plants, uh, green infrastructure, and drinking water. Would you submit a statement on that for the record, please? Now, I note similarly, uh, according to an EPA report on wastewater infrastructure for 2008, the need is $298.1 billion. Uh, and I, am I correct in assuming that wastewater needs have increased since 2008? Yep, that's probably a good assumption, sir. Would you give us the real number for the record, please, and submit that at, at, at the earliest time that you can comfortably do so? Um, now, H.R. 1 also cuts the wastewater uh, ro revolving fund from $2.1 billion to $690 million. Uh, would you please submit to us what would be the practical impact of these cuts? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think in the summer you can tell us, though, that these cuts are going to be extremely destructive to the well-being of the Great Lakes and to the protection of that absolutely wondrous treasure. Am I correct or incorrect? The, the larger the cut, the less we can afford to clean up and protect the Great Lakes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have yield back three seconds. Chairman yields back his time. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Administrator, uh, a couple of questions regarding EPA staff resources. Your Inspector General says that you need better agency-wide control over staff resources. But in April of 2010, you disposed of the position management and control manual. In response, the EPA OIG stated, quote, without an agency-wide position management program, EPA leadership lacks reasonable assurance that it is using personnel in an effective and ef efficient manner to achieve missions results, end quote. In light of this, considering the productivity gains throughout the economy, how can we be confident that all 18,000 FTEs are required for the core mission? Um, just over 17,000 FTE, sir, are, um, uh, what we did was get rid of the manual because it was outdated, and rather than start from uh, an outdated piece of work, what we've done is focus on strategic planning and made decisions to align our resources with our needs. There's lots of local uh, work that's done in the regions and individual offices to ensure that our workforce is efficiently used. Uh, how many employees uh are DC based versus field based? Are DC based? I, I believe about uh, 40, 45 percent of our employees are actually in the DC metropolitan area, not necessarily in DC proper. And what percentage of employees agency wide are eligible to retire this fiscal year? 
Um, I, I don't know that number off the top of my head, but it is significant. If you could provide Probably that. close to 20 percent, but we'll get your number to for the, the record. Committee. Uh, how many employees are dedicated to regulatory and enforcement mission? Uh, regulatory enforcement will get you the number as we sit here, sir. All right. Um, um, and, and what are the job demands that are heaviest? Uh, legal, enforcement, investigations? Can you give us a breakdown? Uh, certainly. Uh, just roughly, we spend uh, a significant port part of our budget on uh, funding state programs, but our internal FTE are split between research and development, which is a, a rather large investment. Our enforcement program and our regulatory programs uh, are, of course, large as well. In case of a hiring freeze or other steps to achieve a reduction in force, what percentage of employees could be reassigned to meet essential workforce needs? Could, could be, I'm sorry. What percentage of employees could be reassigned to meet essential workforce needs? Um, well, you said in case of a reduction in force or a shutdown? Or a hiring freeze, yes. Or in case of a shutdown. Um, in the case of a shutdown, EPA has uh, faced that obviously once before and looked to keep a staff that was mainly uh, available to respond to emergencies. We have a hazardous waste and chemical emergency function and uh, that probably is the most essential of what we do. Then we keep an, uh, uh, the rest of our staff to try to keep the, the place running in terms of uh, computer systems, that kind of thing. Now, a couple questions on your workload. Uh, after Congress passed ERA, grants made with stimulus funds went out quickly. The uh, President signed the Recovery Act in February of 2009. By September 30th of 2009, EPA had awarded uh, $6,483 million plus in grants and over $302 million in contracts. How did the agency handle this increased workload? Well, we were fortunate under ERA in that uh, the grants went to places where we already had uh, s uh, systems set up. So for the state revolving funds, that money goes out by formula to the states. Under the Superfund and Brownfields program, we uh, had active contracts already that we could tap to continue or in some cases start new cleanups. And the diesel uh, uh, emission reduction program was a competitive program plus a formula-driven program. Were temporary contract employees hired to manage any of the ERA fund request? Were temporary workforce managed to hire? Uh, not to my knowledge, sir. We'll double check that, sir. Did ongoing pre-ERA contracts suffer? Uh, I don't know that they would. I, you mean from a management perspective? It certainly took uh, resources to manage the new money, but again, because so much of it went through programs we already had, it provided an opportunity to ensure efficient use of resources. Um, do you know how many permanent n new private sector jobs were created? We, we do have those estimates, sir, and we're happy to get them to you. And um, <clears throat> Does the agency analyze the cost and quality of its contract services? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, there have been uh, uh, GAO reports, Inspector General reports on our largest contracts, which are under the Superfund program, and EPA, uh, and, and in this administration, we've taken yet another look at trying to find ways to efficiently use that money. Um, and for the rest of our contracts, yes, of course, we have to comply with government procurement, which requires uh, review of contracts. My time's expired. Thank you, ma'am. Gentlemen's time expired. Chairman Act recognizes the uh, ranking member on uh, Mr. Rush for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Madam uh, Administrator, your testimony references the EPA's budget request for an additional $6.4 million to conduct pilots in disadvantaged communities to evaluate and reduce risk from toxic air pollutants. Can you describe how Toxic, toxic air pollutant emissions may disproportionately impact uh, disadvantaged urban areas? Well, the, the issue isn't um, the people, it's the sources, sir. Uh, what we know, and it's a, a statement of fact, is that there are a concentration of sources in areas that tend to be um, poorer. Um, it's, it's always the chicken and egg which came, cl came first, but it's just the way it happens. And what happens over time is that you have large emissions of toxics. Mercury is a great example. Mercury 
uh, a significant portion of the mercury emitted stays close to where it's emitted. And so those communities just have a higher burden. Uh, there are places that in general have higher levels of air pollution. If the Republican budget cuts of $3 billion to the agency were enacted, what additional programs would need to be cut? What enforcement actions would need to be curtailed? What would be some of the consequences of these cuts as it relates to protecting the public health? Well, we have not done a full analysis of uh, HR1. Uh, we heard some of the uh, major cuts I happen to know are in um, the state revolving funds. So that's less money that goes out to uh, invest in water and wastewater uh, facilities. Um, and there's certainly still a huge need, as we heard earlier, in many communities around the country. There is uh, a cut to um, uh, the Great Lakes program, obviously important to you, being from Illinois. Uh, and I think uh, the Chesapeake Bay program, another uh, national treasure, uh, if you will. Uh, there are cuts to our Office of Research and Development, to our science programs, which I think um, I've committed that science should be the backbone of our work at EPA, yeah. uh, and other cuts uh, which are smaller uh, in, in various places. These cuts, uh, I agree, these are, are draconian cuts that will negatively impact millions of Americans throughout uh, our nation who are uh, desperately in need of, uh, of your services and your programs. Uh, what are the numbers in terms of, uh, maybe you haven't done a study on this, but uh, let me ask the question. Uh, have you all studied uh, the impact uh, of urban youth, uh, uh, how asthma impacts urban youth and other illnesses as it relates to toxic emissions? Uh, urban young well, we know that air pollution is a contributor to asthma attacks. We know that asthma rates have gone up, uh, especially in certain populations, Puerto Rican population, asthma rates are very high, higher than the national average. The African American population, asthma rates are higher than the national average. Uh, and of course, one of the good news uh, items is that the ability to treat asthma attacks has gotten better. So you can uh, hopefully avoid some hospital visits uh, just through treatment. But the prevalence of asthma has continued to uh, increase uh, in some populations it's staying steady. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> uh, uh, continuing in the area of public health, there was a recent study uh, by the American Lung Association uh, on uh, public health impacts on coal-fired power plant emissions. And as you know, uh, my uh, state is a coal-producing state, and the, the coal won't go away. Uh, and, but we have to figure out a way of, of using the coal uh, and making it less invasive uh, in terms of being a pollutant or, or making it a non-pollutant if possible. Uh, are you aware of this study by the American Lung Association, and what is your reaction to this study? Yes, sir, I'm aware of it. Uh, and what, what is your reaction to this study? Well, not having reviewed it line by line, I, I can simply align myself with the idea that um, there are toxic emissions that come from burning coal. The good news is that they can be controlled. We've, we've developed scrubbers in this country to deal with acid rain. We've developed SCRs to deal with ozone pollution and smog. We've developed uh, opportunities to deal with mercury's cadmium and uh, uh, hydrochloric acid gas. All those opportunities are there, but uh, it does require an investment in those plants. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I've got about four seconds. I just wanted to use this last second. To, you've done a fine job, Madam Administrator, and uh, I think you should be applauded for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, for my colleagues, we're supposed to expect a series of votes at 11.20. What I'd like to ask, uh, if you all would agree upon, I'm going to send a member over to the floor, and this is for you, Administrator, also, to figure out your time schedule, so that when that it's a 15-minute vote, then there'll be a motion to recommit, and then another 15-minute vote. So I think we can keep the hearing going while this process continues, and if that's agreeable um, to both sides, that's what we would like to do. We will try to do that then. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Thank five you. Minutes. Uh, thank you, Administrator Jackson, for being here again. 
Uh, the EPA has decided to propose and finalize greenhouse gas regulations for power plants and refineries by entering into a consent agreement with environmental organizations. And I've heard uh, statements from the EPA uh, that they're looking at, or you guys are looking at, several categories, quote unquote, for new source performance standards. So outside of power plants and refineries, what specific source categories is EPA reviewing for greenhouse gas regulations? Excuse me. Those are the two, sir. That's the only two. So oh. there are, you are, uh, the EPA is not looking at other sources? No, sir. We actually faced lawsuits to promulgate four other sectors. Um, I'm aware of uh, one for several uh, manufacturing sectors. and. When you look at greenhouse gas emissions, they're largest from power sector and refineries. So rather than start with the small sources, we decided to start with them. So oil. it would be accurate to say that the EPA is not looking uh, at electric arc furnaces as a new source. Electric arc furnaces used in manufacturing of uh, various metals. Uh, no, no, I, I do believe we have lawsuits. I just need to be clear from groups asking us to promulgate those uh, requirements and we do have new source review. What is for your opinion on the likelihood of the success of those lawsuits? Well, the, the, the likelihood is high Being that at some point. Successful in that, that you will have to uh, regulate we, them as a new source. We will have to come out with a schedule at some point uh, uh, to, to regulate them, but we believe that we don't need to do that in the immediate future. All right. Uh, are, is the EPA looking at diesel engines? as a new source? Well, uh, mobile sources are different. You know, we are uh, in the process of looking at truck and uh, light duty vehicle rules. So diesel engines Under can power the trucks. president's uh, order on CAFE. That's right. Uh, and Clean Air Act, yes, sir. And that includes uh, large diesel engines? Yes, yes, in yes right. indeed it does, for, for, for trucks. Mm -hmm. And in uh, previous uh, times you were here, uh, even though I represent an urban suburban area of Nebraska, the rest of the state uh, I care about, and we are an ag uh, economy in the state of Nebraska, and I, I'm concerned about the EPA's own figures that 37,000 farms are above the threshold of a major source. You have previously stated that there is no intention by the EPA of regulating them for greenhouse gases. Is that still true today? Uh, that's, that's absolutely true, yes. Right. There is no intention. Uh, but just like in our first discussion on other uh, sources, uh, one lawsuit away from regulating them. Is well, that a fair we, statement? As you heard earlier, we face lots of lawsuits. It's my job as administrator. Has there been a lawsuit already filed to force you to regulate those 37,000 farms for uh, their carbon emissions? Not that I'm aware of. May I, would the gentleman yield one minute? I will yield, uh, yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. Now, my understanding, lawsuits have been filed to invalidate the tailoring rule. Is that true or not? Uh, I believe that's true, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. then uh, with the last part is in particulate matters. Is the EPA reviewing farm practices regarding particulate matter? EPA is required under the Clean Air Act to look at particulate matter pollution every five years and potentially adjust. As you know, the Clean Air Act right now re regulates particulate And matter. you understand that many of our farmers have to plow and that uh, indeed, that sir. raises dust. I, I do indeed, And sir. is there an attempt by the EPA to recognize the reality of farming and dust and exempting our farms? Uh, there is indeed a recognition at EPA that uh, dust happens, uh, but uh, what I can say to you is a good bumper sticker. I'm sorry? That would be a good bumper dust sticker. Happens. Dust happens. That's better than some I've heard, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so what I'd like to say is we've had several listening sessions already on particulate matter with stakeholders in, ag in rural America, in farm country. We have more to do. We do have a determination to make about the current standard, but I've committed that we're going to listen uh, uh, before we do that. Listening's good, exempting them better. <laughs> okay.
Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Administrator, yesterday we held a subcommittee markup of the Republican legislation to overturn the scientific finding that global warming pollution endangers public health and welfare and prevents EPA from setting greenhouse gas emission standards. Do you agree that this legislation will dramatically increase our dependence on foreign oil because it will prevent EPA from taking actions to reduce oil use from cars, trucks, planes, boats, trains, construction equipment, or large industrial users of oil? Yes. Uh, yesterday, retired senior mil military officers sent Congress a letter on this legislation. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert a copy of that letter into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you agree that the views of these heroes that the legislation undermines EPA's regulatory authority that is critical to reducing the clear and present danger to the security and welfare of the United States that our oil dependence represents? I, I certainly agree with the sentiment, sir. Uh, last week, the New York Times reported that radioactive wastewater from hydraulically fractured wells in Pennsylvania and West Virginia has been sent to sewerage plants, even though the radiation levels could be as high as 2,000 times EPA's drinking water standards. This radioactive water was reported to be dumped into rivers, in some cases within a mile of drinking water intake facilities. I know that you immediately went to Pennsylvania to look into the matter, and I commend you for your leadership. In response to the Times series, on Monday, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection released results from seven water samples taken downstream from wastewater treatment plants that show radiation was not elevated. Do you think seven water samples are enough to fully understand the impacts from hydraulic fracturing in the state of Pennsylvania? Uh, sir, our regional scientists uh, responded with a letter, no. The, the short answer is no. I think those are one-time samples, and it depends on flow rate and flow rate in the river uh, as to whether or not there could still be potential radiation entering those wastewater treatments. Do you think that all drinking water systems that are located near wastewater treatment facilities that accept drilling waste should monitor intake water for radioactivity and other potentially hazardous byproducts of these activities? I, th I think unless uh, there is proven evidence that radiation isn't entering into those treatment plants, then that's a good prudent move to, to be uh, monitoring more frequently. So you believe that they should all be monitored? Uh, certainly monitored. And uh, again, if, someone, if, if no one's sending wastewater to the treatment plants, then you could stop. But the concern is related to uh, the transport of wastewater. Uh, so if they are accepting drilling waste, then there should be monitoring. Is that what you're saying? Right. If the treatment plants are accepting drilling waste, and unless you can prove without a shadow of doubt that there's no right. radiation there, and that's going to be – monitoring is our key to give the public confidence that yeah, – there's, there's no question that families do not want polluted water coming into their children's bodies at an early age. It can have a dramatic impact upon their development. So I agree with you. The water should be monitored. Uh, is diluting the drilling waste – by disposing of it in rivers or streams, a permissible way to treat wastewater that contains radioactive or other hazardous materials? Uh, generally, uh, that, that is not the way the system works. We prefer to see treatment or removal of the pollution before it enters the waterway. That's not to say that some amounts of radiation in the waterway wouldn't happen naturally or even through the treatment process. Do current EPA regulations allow for wastewater treatment facilities to accept wastewater from drilling operations if they do not know what materials are in it? Now, the pretreatment standards under the Clean Water Act require that you know what you're accepting um, and, and have uh, adequate characterization of that. So if it is illegal, does EPA plan to tell states that they should stop allowing this to occur as uh, it seems to have occurred in Pennsylvania? I, I, I believe that EPA is working right now to understand whether this is still going on and to what degree there have been uh, pretreatment standards. And I, I think EPA in its letter uh, requested that Pennsylvania basically relook at every permit for any facility that may be uh, accepting that wastewater. And given the findings in the New York Times, what are the plans that the EPA is making, if any, to uh, change the, the 
processes at the agency in terms of worker safety, impact on children, uh, the pollution, the radioactive chemicals, other contaminants in wastewater. Are there oh. any changes that you're making? I think we can we can certainly improve. Listen, EPA, we're proud of uh, our record in having uh, $6 million in this budget to look at hydrofracking, but we've also said at the same time that if we become aware of public health threats, they need to be addressed. And so EPA needs to work. The state has a huge role to play here in ensuring that their citizens are safe. We would like to be in the process of supporting them, but we certainly can take actions on our own if we need to. Gentlemen's time expired. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Oregon. Um, Thank you, Chairman. For five minutes. Uh, Administrator Jackson, thanks for being here again today. We appreciate it. I've got a couple of questions I'd like to run past you as well. Um, and, and one involves the utility MAC that your, your agency is working on. And I wondered if EPA is going to provide any flexibility for coal plants that have agreed to state approved, federally enforceable shutdown dates for their operations. And, and to wit, it's the, the PGE plant in my district, Portland General Electric, that entered into an agreement with the state to shut down and they'll install 60 million of mercury and nitrous oxide uh, uh, scrubbers and all before 2020 when they close. Now that's still 20 years before the life of the plant runs out but the deal they reached was close it down. They're concerned that your utility MAC would force an additional installation of $510 million worth of equipment between now and when they're already set to close it down in 2020. Um, and so it, it, and it's obviously an important issue for... Yeah, well, two things. First, the uh, utility air toxics rule has not come out yet. It hasn't right. been proposed. It's due next week. And then it'll go through public comment before finalization. So I really can't comment on what that rule will say or won't say until it's absolutely done. What I can also say is I'm aware of this matter. It was brought to my attention by one of uh, your colleagues. And uh, there's certainly potential for discussions about this specific incident um, that I think can continue. It's a, it's a pretty unique incident. I mean, this is a situation. They reach an agreement with the state. They're complying with environmental rules in existence. They're phasing out their plant 20 years early. They're installing 60 million in recovery already. He's trying to look at jobs, economy, rates. And if they were to shut it down early uh, because of this, earlier than that, then you've got a problem on the grid, I think, in terms of replacing that power uh, abruptly. So I, I just, I'm glad you're flagging that. And if you want to make a note, that would be really good. <laughs> um, and then the, the other issue involves, and, and there's been some discussion about this, the uh, cement rule. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a facility, imagine that, in my district. Uh, that has uh, done its best. Uh, I think they've spent something like uh, $20 million to reduce, uh, to put in new scrubbers and all to reduce their emissions. I think they're pushing 90% reduction today. They've got 116 employees. Um, they, uh, three years uh, before the EPA standards take effect, they, uh, they've reduced their emissions by 90% and, and before the rest of the cement industry has to comply. Concern is that the uh, cement rule, uh, th that they don't have the technology available to them to get above, much above that 90 percent. And the way this is playing out, they may end up having to close. Now, this is a rural county, got 116 jobs. And meanwhile, I know there's a huge, big new construction project uh, at Intel in Oregon. I'm told uh, they're buying their cement from China. And I think your own data from EPA's roadmap for mercury in July of 06 said three quarters or 83 percent of the mercury deposited in the U.S. originates from international sources. So I just, uh, when I go home and try and explain what's happening from back here to those folks who are looking at losing their 116 jobs, biggest employer in a little county, and they just put 20 million in scrubbers, and then they see, uh, you know, most of the mercury is coming in from overseas anyway or internationally. And we're kind of like on the West Coast where tsunamis and bad stuff comes in the air. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any flexibility that you might be able to make a note on and help us on. Uh, when the cement uh, toxics rule was promulgated, there was uh, lots of consideration of sources, individual sources that were putting on controls early and doing everything right. they could to um, bring down their emissions early. I'm happy to have my air office take a look at this yeah. specific source. I really don't have the details. Right. We tried to get a subcategory, which I think is allowed under the under the Clean Air Act, and that was uh, uh, rejected. 
So, but if you could take it, I appreciate that. Happy to have them. And I, I want to associate myself with the comments from my colleague, Mr. Terry of Nebraska. My district's very rural, very dry. We do dry land wheat, um, uh, we cattle. Uh, I, I, my guys are, are ranchers are, are very concerned about the particulate dust rule that's being considered. Uh, cattle ranchers tell me you couldn't drive down an eastern Oregon gravel road and not probably trigger up enough dust to maybe violate it. And the wheat guys are saying we may have to drag a some sort of mister behind our, our, our equipment to uh, tamp down the dust. And if we had that much water in eastern Oregon, I guess we wouldn't have dry land wheat. So as you listen to these comments, I, I hope you'll take that into consideration. And finally, we've got a chart here that, that, that just, I think, reflects um, the concern that's coming our way in terms of just the multitude of regulations that different industries are having to deal with all at once or in a fairly short timeline. This is potential air regulations affecting the forest products industries. And I'm just wondering, do you do a cumulative impact look at all these regulations on an industry set and, and do any kind of economic analysis of what that may mean? Because, boy, I'm hearing it back the other direction right now. We, we are required under the President's executive order to look at cum the retroactively at our regulations to determine whether there are more effective ways to regulate, to get the clean air and clean water benefits we all want, and uh, also look at costs and impacts. We're happy to do that. I, I have seen those charts. Industry produces them. Um, they, they come out every few years. This one's not unique. Um, but, you know, the, if you look at what we're required to do under law to update our standards, uh, many of those things are not regulations, but science and, and health standards. Uh, gentleman's time's expired. Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Katz, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Administrator Jackson, for being with us and for your testimony. It, you know, it's well documented that the nation's water utilities will have to address hundreds of billions of dollars worth of infrastructure needs over the next few decades. EPA, for example, found in 2007 that drinking water systems alone will have to spend $335 billion to maintain and replace their infrastructure over the next 20 years. But these estimates do not take into account additional costs that water utilities may incur as they are forced to react to the impacts of changing climate conditions on their communities and their water supplies. In fact, a 2009 study by the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies and others estimated that adaptation measures could cost America's water systems up to $900 billion through 2050. Are there some programs in place that you're putting into place at EPA at helping states and communities adapt their operations and infrastructure to changing climate conditions over the next several decades? EPA has a focus on what is kind of, uh, the buzzword is green infrastructure, the idea being that as much as possible uh, you work with nature, you understand that they're uh, in those places where you might have wetlands or in wetlands in the future, those provide an opportunity to filter water. Uh, I know uh, New Orleans has a pretty innovative project that way. Uh, so we do try to work with systems, but it would be unfair for me not to say that that is a significant issue facing uh, water and wastewater systems uh, as our climate changes. I'm just curious, to are, are you getting into that topic as you assess, you know, infrastructure needs? Is it compounding the way or com making it uh, more complex the way you're looking at the future as you think about infrastructure needs just based on current uh, situation. Yes, yes. That's so th your modeling is, is ad uh, including adapting. Well, yes, but our cost estimates, the numbers you uh, gave didn't really, uh, the 335 mi billion doesn't really look no. at adaptation right. costs, but we know that costs are going to increase d dramatically if you project out 10, 20, or 30 years uh, in terms of need. Can you, are you trying to put a dollar uh, on that? Um, I will check to see what we have. Um, I'd be interested to know how you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Another topic, EPA has a long history of providing categorical grants to states and tribes mm -hmm. to implement environmental laws. These grants are designed to help states clean up hazardous waste, enforce drinking water standards, and reduce exposure to toxins such as leads and PCBs. In these economic times, state budgets are spread way too thin, and these funds that they may have allocated uh, maybe have been squandered for other needs. Uh, I, I know we both agree that these are essential grants. Uh, the pre President's 2012 budget requests an increase for these grant programs. Uh, is that, uh, would you talk about the ways that that might fit into um, the state's budget woes? 
Yeah, uh, it's a recognition, uh, Congresswoman, that states are strapped and that states are the primary deliverers of environmental protection. They write the vast majority of the permits. They do the vast majority of the inspections uh, and enforcement. Many states implement their own hazardous waste cleanup programs, uh, air, water quality, tribal assistance uh, yeah, exactly. also. So we felt that y in these tight times, it was a prudent investment to invest in the states, um, even though we're um, having to cut back in right. other areas. And that leads to a follow-up question, which, you know, this, uh, the Republican Continuing Resolution, H.R. 1, cuts funding for these very grants by $60 million from 2010 levels and $220 million from the agency's uh, 2011 request. Uh, and we're doing this, you know, uh, th uh, believing that we're doing, uh, you know, the majority thinks they're doing the right thing for the federal government's response to our deficits. But what we're doing to states is leaving them high and dry. Uh, and uh, in, in general, would you specify uh, what the impact of this kind of decrease would have on their, the state's ability to address, for example, public health? Well, ECOS, the Environmental Council of the States, thanked us for the president's budget. They're very concerned about uh, cuts to state programs. And as I said, these are the, this is the meat and potatoes of environmental protection. These exactly. are the folks who are on the front line having to respond to a plant who wants to expand but needs an air permit in order to do it. So you'll have an impact on public health because you'll either have um, unpermitted expansions, which is not good, or you'll have an impact on economic development because they can't get uh, timely action. So we're trying to invest in uh, state-level environmental protection. Any, okay. Um, I have another question, but I'll, I'll, I'll yield back in the interest of getting to more people before we vote. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, thanks. Uh, our friend from California, Chair, now recognizes the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Let, let me just defer for a, a, a The Chair second. now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Minister, I assume you're committed to good scientific knowledge and uh, a commitment to communication with states. But let me ask you a couple things. Have you read the whole New York Times series on fracking for Pennsylvania? I have, sir. Quickly. Uh, was it fully scientifically accurate? No, no, I think that there was. Did you respond in any public way to challenge the scientific accuracy of anything in that article? Me personally, yes. no. I, I decided that the. Uh, were you, are you aware that although the reporter extensively quotes it. former. Uh, to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Secretary John Hanger in the article that he never actually talked to him? Yes, I've read Mr. Hanger's blog on this. Are you, uh, who is the EPA employee or consultant that spoke anonymously with the New York Times this article? And will you give us their name? They're anonymous, sir. How would I know? I'm just trying to get scientific data here. Uh, can you get us the unpublished uh, EPA report, the 2009, that's referenced in the article? Certainly. Um, Continuing on with the scientific accuracy of the article, the article says that DEP employees doubled uh, in the last two years who would look at fracking. Do you have any idea how many that was? Um, I just spoke to former Governor Rendell, who I think said it was uh, went from 85 to 200 plus employees. It went from 88 to 202, and that's not doubling. Um, did you meet or call or otherwise directly communicate with Secretary of uh, the Pennsylvania Department of, uh, of Environmental Protection, uh, Mike Crancher? I attempted to, sir, but uh, he didn't. Uh, uh, um Are you aware that your uh, regional director, uh, Garvin, um, has also not spoken to Secretary that's not Prancer true, until sir. moments before the public letter was released? That, that's because Secretary Crancer canceled the call that we had set up with him. For a letter was nonetheless released. Are you aware of the, the content of that letter that says uh, basically that EPA is claiming jurisdiction on a number of water issues and telling Pennsylvanians That's what to do about That's not at all true. I, I have the letter, sir. Happy to share it. It says that I we have the are ready I have it to too, and it does say the that. state, but we well, what specific have the actions? To take what specific state. actions? Are you aware of what specific actions well, DEP? When, when a gentleman yield, I, I, uh, what specific you've given a uh, what specific really actions? actions? The, the chairman emeritus will will not interject. The chairman from Pennsylvania has the time. The gentleman from Pennsylvania will continue. Do you have a list of what specific actions DEP is doing or not doing, which you believe is in violation of uh, sir, water standards? Sir, we haven't claimed that DEP is in violation. If you read the letter, it talks about necessary sampling to assure public health and safety. The, the letter does indeed claim, and I will submit it for the record if that's all right. It says the EPA will take additional steps directly using our authorities, and it goes on to claim those. So it does do that. 
Um, it, that's out of context, sir. It talks about I, the I need to support letter. the state, but it assures the state that we will take a steps if necessary to, to protect but you're the state. But, but I would still like you to provide this committee with the list of what specific things you're claiming the DEP is doing, not doing. Now, in the issue of radiation, the New York Times article claims it's hundreds or thousands of times the level of radiation. Do you have information you can provide this committee on naturally occurring background levels of radium that occur when someone drills a water well, when someone digs a basement for a house? Can you provide us that information so we can compare it with these claims? Will you do that? Certainly. We, we can. Uh, I think it's going to be based on uh, DEP sampling, Pennsylvania sampling, right. but certainly. Is, uh, is the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania tolerating dumping of untreated water now? I don't know that to be the case, sir. I know the article alleges that, but I don't know that to be the case. Uh, well, but yet, and yet EPA has not made any public statements regarding we the scientific... We are attempting to get data with the state. You have sent a letter to Pennsylvania claiming that. jurisdiction of action you're going to no, take. No, we have not, sir. Prior to your that. regional director, or you have still not spoken with our, our secretary... I reached out EPA. to the governor, who did not take my call, and we reached out to the director. We actually had a call scheduled. And I was meeting on Monday with the secretary of DEP, who says he'd be glad to take your call, but you haven't called him yet. Um, well, same. I'd, I'd be happy to take okay. this if you'd like to speak. So given that you haven't reviewed the New York Times for scientific comment, or, or say accuracy and accuracies, you have not spoken to the secretary of DEP. Uh, your regional director only spoke of them after this letter was publicly released. Uh, we don't have the scientific data on that. I, it begs the question, do you believe the Federal Environmental Protection Agency cares more about Pennsylvania's families than Pennsylvanians do? No, sir, not necessarily. <laughs> then I would certainly hope that you would start to communicate with Pennsylvanians and our DEP and ask them what they're doing and uh, review that before EPA That's claims jurisdiction. That's precisely what the letter does, action. sir. The it's EPA like claims they're taking it. action there. I yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen, time's expired. Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Natsui, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank you, Administrator, to be here with us today, and thank you for your leadership on embracing environmental stewardship. In my home district of Sacramento, we have over 220 clean energy companies that are selling and manufacturing advanced technologies. I routinely hold clean energy roundtable and convening forums with CEOs, utilities, colleges, and local business leaders in Sacramento, and they all are eager to see national energy standards. It's critical that we continue to invest in the future of our clean energy economy to create jobs, to preserve the environment, and to establish energy independence, and I believe the EPA's budget just does just that. More than half of the total renewable energy supplied to electricity users in Sacramento last year came from biomass waste and residues. EPA recently announced it would defer for three years greenhouse gas permitting requirements for industries that use biomass. I understand the agency intends to use this time to further analyze scientific issues associated with carbon dioxide emissions from biomass-fired sources. How does EPA's budget proposal address the plan, study, and rulemaking associated with biomass? Um, the budget proposal uh, envisions uh, using that time to do a peer-reviewed study, um, um, I believe with the National Academy of Sciences, but let me confirm that for you, to look at uh, the uh, carbon footprint, essentially, of various forms of biomass. So would cuts to EPA's budget affect the agency's timeline to determine rules on biomass? I, I think there are some concerns that, depending on the cut and also uh, potential uh, rider language that we've seen, that there could be some impacts. But it is not intended in the President's budget that there be any impact on Certainly. that. Certainly. Uh, I hope you'll be able to provide regions like Sacramento regulatory certainty soon on this biomass issue as we look to increase our use of renewable energy resources. In Sacramento, businesses with projects that are potential sources of air emissions are currently required to obtain permits from our local air district and separately from the EPA. I understand the implementation of a state implementation plan for the Sacramento region will streamline the administrative process and help prevent this dual permitting requirement. Does your budget address the timely implementation of SIPs? If so, how? 
Well, our budget does include funding for states for development of SIPs and for uh, the air program's review of SIPs. Uh, and uh, although we are uh, trying to do more and more with less and less, I believe that the money we have is adequate to fund our, our, our needs in that manner. During the CR debate, we saw a number of amendments that would have blocked any EPA action on anything to do whatsoever with any greenhouse gases. From my understanding of the impacts of this provision, this would have serious unintended consequences for job creation and public health throughout the country. Could you explain how HR1 would have affected the greenhouse gas reporting rule? Uh, so uh, excuse me. Uh, there is a rider in HR1 that would have uh, prevented EPA's implementation of the reporting rule for all major sources. Actually, for all sources, we simply would not have had implementation. So, what would happen to a new project seeking a pre-construction permit in states like Arkansas, California, Wyoming, and Oregon that have federal implementation plans for permitting for greenhouse gases? Would they still be able to get a permit if EPA is stopped from taking action? or to the Energy Star program, which saved consumers $17 billion in 2009. Um, with respect to the Energy Star program, um, the uh, original language in uh, the rider that had to do with greenhouse gases appeared to uh, 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 put in jeopardy implementation of Energy Star. I'm not sure that uh, new language uh, 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 would do that. Um, Actually, excuse me, no, I'm sorry. In the riders, yes, it yes. would put into uh, jeopardy the Energy Star program. As far as uh, permitting, yes, uh, major source permitting would be in jeopardy uh, depending on uh, the rider that passed. Okay. I thank you. Gen gentlelady yields back her time. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, or Administrator, uh, again, I appreciate you being here. As you recall, when you were here before, a month ago, I submitted to you a list of, I think, six or eight questions, uh, obviously still waiting on the answers of those. I won't revisit them today, but, but just to emphasize that I, I would like to have answers to those questions. Let me uh, spend a minute and give you a chance to clarify some of your testimony that you gave in response to Ranking Member Waxman's questions to you. Um, <clears throat> Perhaps you could define what you mean by the opposite of true. The, the opposite of truth is untruth, a lie, not accurate, fiddle faddle. Did, did you mean to imply that the chairman of the full committee had lied? It, it is not true to say that uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, regulation of automobiles, which has already been successfully accomplished in this country, has had any impact on gas prices. And further, uh, it is uh, just the opposite. It, it is not, it, yeah, it has but had an impact my on time, reducing but here's, here's the deal. of gasoline. The bill could not be more clear because it explicitly preserves the car rule. There is no secret here. There is nothing done to disturb the car rule. In fact, it is the chairman's stated goal that the rule will be protected and proceed. The language contained in his bill was carefully drafted and vetted to ensure that the car rule remains effective. And but, I would encourage you to reevaluate your comments in, in light of the fact of what is actually contained within the bill, and I will be happy to provide you a copy of the bill if that would be helpful to you. Um, if you want Let me ask you a question. Well, per perhaps we're, we're going to run out of time because of the vote. And okay, I'd, I'd like to be able to respond, but I'll do it on the record, if that's okay. I, I would very much like for you to, to, to clarify the record because that is important. I, I don't think you meant to say what you said. Let me ask you a question about your tenure at the EPA. There have been a lot of court cases that you've settled with environmental groups where the settlement resulted in a new rulemaking. Do you have an idea of how many times that has happened? Uh, I know it happens. At, it, it's not unique to my tenure at EPA, but it certainly happens quite often. We settle cases it rather than be, litigate them. I think instructive for this committee to see how, how the number of cases that you've settled in this way compared with uh, with predecessors. It seems like we're, we're we're quick to cite judicial reasons for the making of the many of the new rules. 
but how many rules have been promulgated absent a judge's order under your tenure? Do we have an idea about that? Oh, I, I can certainly get you that. We, we promulgate many minor rules, but our major rules are either under court order deadline because prior rules were thrown out, those are the Clean Air Act rules, uh, or the results of settlements or litigation, uh, where EPA had a clear duty to propose a rule to protect human health but had not met that. that Generally, is it more cost effective to enter in an agreement with the parties in a dispute or to go to judicial action? Well, that goes to litigation risk, and that's a determination made by uh, the Department of Justice and EPA well, together. Whether it's fair or not, the, the, uh, the implication is that your administration tends to go more quickly the judicial well, I don't, I don't think that's fair. I think it's not a fair conclusion. Well, All administrations of the EPA. I would that. like, I don't know about the rest of the committee, but I would like to see the data to be able to, uh, to make that determination. Um, let me ask you a question. Are you familiar with uh, a case that has occurred down in Texas in Parker County dealing with the, uh, a, a drilling company known as Range Drilling? and the appearance of methane gas in some water wells? Uh, I am generally familiar with it, yes. Are you familiar with the Railroad Commission of Texas that they held a hearing in, uh, in January and they recently published their, um, their report from that? Have you a copy of that? I, I don't have a copy, but I'm generally familiar that they, uh, with their findings. Well, can I encourage you to get a copy because your regional administrator went on local television in early December with some fairly inflammatory remarks and the result of the investigation in which the EPA did not participate, I might add, although it was requested by the state regulatory agency for the EPA to participate, but EPA chose not to. But the conclusions that were put forward on the television uh, uh, remarks were in fact not accurate. The source of the gas present in the water wells in question was from an entirely different geologic strata than the strata that has been uh, used for the extraction of natural gas with, with hydrologic fracturing. So I, I think it is so important that the EPA work closely and not at, at, in an adversarial relationship with the state agency. Texas is a big state. You can't possibly be everywhere all the time. In my opinion, you should rely on the state agencies to help you rather than uh, be always at a 90 degree angle. And this activity by your Region 6 Administrator in December, I found to be very injurious and I would like for you to look into that and provide us your evaluation of those activities. And I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Administrator Jackson. EPA's mission which you know well is to protect human health and the environment on which we all rely. And it's a mission that's critically important to children and families and communities across America. In my home state of Wisconsin, we treasure and cherish our environmental resources. We rely heavily on groundwater and freshwater from abundant lakes throughout the state. We believe in protecting our wetlands and ensuring our air is clean to breathe. The means by which you carry out your mission is by enforcement of laws and regulations. Um, briefly about the budget, um, at first review, I believe the President's budget recognizes the importance of EPA's mission while responsibly cutting spending. These cuts have been proposed after serious evaluation and careful consideration. And they demonstrate an effort to responsibly reduce the deficit during these very difficult economic times. In sharp contrast, H.R. 1, as passed by the House Republicans, would cut EPA's overall budget by 30 percent this year. It's the largest cut to any federal agency. It would impose deep cuts to state drinking water and clean water state revolving funds, programs to cl clean up brownfields and Superfund sites, and efforts to address greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants. In fact, I believe H.R. 1 strips EPA of its ability to meet its basic and uh, important uh, mission. Now, I'm certainly not naive. Times are tough. The economy is struggling to recover from a deep recession. And I agree with my Republican colleagues that we must reduce the deficit and bring our budget into balance. But we have to be smart about it. We have to be smart about it. We can't halt efforts to ensure clean air, 
safe water and a sustainable environment by putting our heads in the sand while, um, and blindly cutting critical programs. Such action is irresponsible. I agree with our president when he said in the State of the Union that if we are to win the future, we must out-educate, out-innovate, and out-build the rest of the world. By making sound investments in our environmental resources, we're creating jobs, growing our economy, and protecting our national security. These days, it seems that every regulation has folks and uh, industry crying wolf about the dire consequences that such regulations will have on our economy. This is, uh, this is for decades now, we've heard uh, that regulations to address, for example, lead in paint or acid rain or CFC would cause great suffering. And today, we're often hearing the same story um, about regulating greenhouse gases, air hazards, and toxic chemicals. Uh, we hear uh, cries that they will force firms out of business, et cetera. Administrator Jackson, can you speak to this doomsday scenario that we're hearing all around us? Um, historically speaking, when EPA regulations have gone into effect, have the economic costs been on a par with the estimates? And uh, just broadly, and then I'd like to address uh, a couple of specific uh, historical regulations. Uh, historically, the costs are much, much less than industry estimates and often less than EPA's. The acid rain trading program was 20 times cheaper than what industry said uh, it would be. Um, we uh, already know that we uh, hear oftentimes, I remember with the uh, uh, stratospheric ozone program, that when we switched uh, CFCs, it would cause a quiet death for the refrigeration industry. Nothing of the kind happened. We saw an industry thrive. So uh, over 40 years of the Clean Air Act, GDP is up 207 percent and air pollution is down 50 plus percent. And I think you can have both economic growth and clean air and public health. So when the Energy and Commerce Committee was considering the Clean Air Amend Act's amendment of 1990, an industry estimated that the measure would cost between 51 and 91 billion dollars. Was that accurate? Um, no, I don't. I, I know that the estimates were much, much less than the 1990 uh, industry estimates. It was not accurate at all. Okay. When and utilities estimated that um, SO2 allowances would cost 1,000 to 1,500 dollars per ton. Did that end up ringing true? No, that was not true either. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on to another question, but I see I only have 15 seconds left, so I think I'll rest there and, and submit that uh, separately in writing. Thank you. The gentleman who yields back, uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Ladd of Ohio. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Administrator. Thanks for being with us today. Good seeing you again. And I appreciated uh, our meetings that we've had in the past. And if I could, uh, I know it's kind of come up already, already about the, um, on the clean water uh, and drinking water revolving funds. If I could just bring that up a little bit, because on page two of your, your testimony, you said that because of the constrained fiscal environment, the budget decreases the state revolving funds by nearly $950 million while supporting a long-term goal of providing about 5 percent of the total water infrastructure spending and spurring more efficient system-wide planning. But when you're cutting uh, $947 million from these funds and you're allocating at the same time about $252 million in climate change, and even though, you know, we've been talking about that, and that's a, that $252 million is an increase of $56 million from those that were enacted in fiscal year 2010, you know, it's getting to the point is we've talked that these localities just can't afford this. And I just my question is, is that as we're increasing funds for the climate fund programs that, you know, Congress has made clear for weeks that we don't have, you don't have the authority to regulate, my question is what are we going to do for these communities out there that are really suffering? Well, we continue to fund uh, in the President's proposed budget the state revolving funds. The goal is to try to get to a point, remember they're revolving, so they are loan paybacks that come in that also go into the funds to get to a point where we're funding about 5 percent of uh, need on an annual basis, not the cumulative need. And uh, they are tough choices, I would certainly admit that. But uh, after unprecedented uh, expenditures in the Recovery Act, we had $6 billion there. 
Uh, plus, the president uh, had a huge increase in the SRFs in his 2010 budget. In a tough year, uh, it seemed that we uh, would just not be able to be as generous this year. Well, and also, I know some other members have brought this question about the uh, on the green side, but under your budget proposal for the agency mandates that no less than 10 percent of the drinking water fund capitalization grant be made available for projects that include these green infrastructure, water or energy efficient improvements or other environmentally and innovative projects. And again, though, when the communities back home don't have the dollars to comply right now, what, what do I tell them when they call me and say, you know, how are we going to comply with the mandates? Well, the state revolving funds are meant to supplement communities, especially small communities. We work very hard with um, rural communities, the rural association uh, as well, to put money to try to help communities comply. But obviously, the vast majority of the systems are paid for by fees. So this money, which goes out in low interest loans for large systems, can be grant forgiveness. I, I admit that there is a huge need out there, but we uh, we can only invest what we can in tight budget times. Okay, could you could you define for me what are spurring more efficient system wide planning? Is this the, the goal of providing five percent of the water infrastructure spending and spurring more efficient system wide planning? Well, I think in many cases you have uh, opportunities. I, I just know this from my state experience to look at regional uh, opportunities where you might have a municipal system, rural systems nearby that might be able to hook in so that you don't have to make uh, the same expenditures. The money is intended to try to get communities to look at the most cost effective way to deliver clean water and deliver wastewater services, recognizing that the federal government simply cannot pay the whole tab and not even the majority of it. Okay, because and that's, um, the way you uh, described it right there, you know, when I think about my area and a lot of the districts out there, we have a problem, of course, that we're very, very rural in a lot of areas, and there's just absolutely no way that, you know, one community could say, well, we're going to work with another community because it would be just too expensive to even try to get one, you know, to have a system for that area. So, you know, I guess when you're looking at using 5% of uh, of that of those dollars for that wouldn't that be in some cases more beneficial to be using those dollars to help these communities that don't have the money that don't you know right now I had a uh, courthouse conference recently in one of my counties and uh, they if I had the mayor there I had I don't I can't tell you how many citizens and they're all talking about the same thing they cannot afford this it's going to drive everybody out they can get out if they can sell their homes now because the cost is going to be so great on their on the water and the sewer side, but I'm I'm very very concerned about these communities not being able to meet these goals that the EPA has mandated on them. Well, sir, I, I, the standards um, for drinking water are federal standards that are intended to protect health, and my belief is every community should have clean water. But I also recognize that some communities are financially strapped, so it's incumbent upon us. Um, uh, not just as EPA, but as a government to try to help those communities, but not to, m not to say, uh, not tell them what the standards are, um, either for drinking water or discharge or raw sewage. Those things impact our water quality. I uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see uh, Lisa Jackson here this morning. I've known her from her days as the commissioner of the New Jersey DEP, and I'm proud to have her at the helm of the U.S. EPA. Um, I know we're here this morning to discuss the fiscal year 2012 proposed budget, but I want to put the issue in a broader context. EPA has a very simple but important mission to protect human health and the environment. As Administrator Jackson noted in her testimony, without adequate funding, EPA would be unable to implement or enforce the laws that protect America's health. When crafting this budget, President Obama had to make tough choices, but the proposed EPA budget will provide EPA with the funding it needs to meet its core mission. The same cannot be said, unfortunately, about the draconian cuts included in H.R. 1, the continuing resolution crafted by the Republicans. I wish I had time to go through all the misguided budget cuts and anti-environmental riders, uh, but I only have five minutes, so I wanted to cite two examples. First, with regard to a rider on the issue of mountaintop mining. <coughs> Excuse me. H.R. 1 contains a provision that would block EPA's oversight of mountaintop removal mining. 
In January, EPA took the rare action of vetoing the Clean Water Act permit application for spruce mine number one. I sent a letter to the administrator late last year signed by 50 of my colleagues supporting her efforts to curtail mountaintop removal mining under the Clean Water Act. Mountaintop removal mining is a dangerous practice that's harmful to our environment and unsafe for those living in nearby communities, and EPA must have the tool to regulate this practice, but essentially H.R. 1 would take it away. Now let me talk about brownfields. H.R. 1 also cuts $30 million from EPA's brownfields program. Over the years, EPA has invested approximately $1.5 billion in brownfield site assessment and cleanup, leveraging $12.9 billion in cleanup and redevelopment dollars, a return on public investment of 8.5 to 1. EPA's brownfields program has resulted in the assessment of more than 14,000 properties, helped to create more than 60,000 new jobs. These numbers only tell part of the story as communities across the country report that brownfields projects are often linchpins to spurring larger revitalization efforts, increasing local tax revenue, and bringing new vitality to struggling neighborhoods and communities. Now, my colleagues on this panel know that the Brownfields program was, was created with bipartisan legislation. Myself and Representative Gilmore signed into law by President George W. Bush. So I was rather shocked to see the cuts to this program in the continuing resolution. H.R. 1 cuts the budget for EPA's Brownfields Revitalization Grant Program by $30 million relative to the fiscal year 2010 enacted budget and by $68 million relative to the President's fiscal year 2011 request. I wanted to ask two questions uh, of uh, Ms. Jackson about Brownfields. First, if you would, what would the cuts in the CR mean for cleanup and redevelopment under the, pr under the Brownfields program? Uh, and then if, what would those cuts mean for private investment in redeveloping these sites? Uh, the CR has, a, I think, a 30 percent cut in the Brownfields funding and the Brownfields fund for fiscal year uh, uh, 2011. We haven't uh, done an impact on sites specifically, but I'll simply say that uh, studies have shown that up to 20 to 1 is the leverage of private money to public money. So for every dollar spent of Brownfields grant funding, usually by a local community, uh, they can leverage that to investments as high as, not always 21, but as high as 20 to 1. You know, the thing that uh, uh, bothers me is that um, what we should be doing with the federal dollars is trying to create jobs, okay? And, and I know this isn't uh, for you to comment on, but it disturbs me because whether I go to the health subcommittee or I go to the environment subcommittee or the er energy subcommittee, I just don't see any effort on the part of the Republicans here or on the floor to create jobs. And we have a very good program here, which really was, I'm not going to say it was a Republican program, but it was, it was touted uh, by uh, uh, President Bush in the beginning of his term. He thought it was a very good environmental program because of the fact that it brought money back to communities and invested and leveraged the private dollars to create jobs create new businesses. And I just cannot see any justification for slashing funding, uh, you know, for brownfields and other programs that create private sector jobs in this economic uh, climate. Uh, I, I, it's cuts like this um, that lead many economists to say that the Republican CR would simply destroy hundreds of thousands of jobs. And this is a perfect example of it. I think it's wrong. Um, and I think that uh, there are many other situations like this. Brownfields is only one example. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chairman yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Bass. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you, Administrator Jackson, for your testimony here this morning. As you know, uh, as you may know, uh, I represent New Second District in New Hampshire. And it's a district in a northeastern state uh, where biomass is a vital part of our clean renewable energy strategy both as a fuel for the generation of electricity from biomass as well as, uh, an, as an alternative heating fuel. We're 86 percent dependent on heating oil in, the nor in Maine and New Hampshire and I would assume also Vermont. Uh, we use it to heat houses, businesses and so forth. I want to uh, 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 express my appreciation for your flexibility in, d in delaying the consideration of how biomass CO2 emissions will be regulated under the Clean Air Act through your December announcement uh, uh, regarding the so-called tailoring rule. And secondly, I also want to express your, my appreciation in uh, your recent release of the Boiler Mac 
uh, rule, which allows for far greater flexibility and more realistic and economically achievable regulation in meeting emissions targets, especially the part that raises the exemption of smaller boilers uh, to up to, uh, to uh, 10 million, I think it's 10 million uh, BTUs. Uh, uh, getting back to the tailoring rule, I believe also in that December announcement, or the, uh, yeah, the December announcement, you discussed uh, that in July the agency would be, um, would be rolling out their uh, rules or proposed rules include, uh, involving the long, what I would consider the long-held and internationally recognized presumption that biomass uh, is a carbon neutral energy source. And I'm just wondering if you could share with me any observations uh, that you have concerning what that announcement may be and what base assumptions the EPA will be making, if any, involving the carbon neutrality of biomass? Um, thank you, Mr. Bass. Well, we are committed to the three-year study because we believe that uh, there will very likely be biomass sources that are carbon neutral. There may well be some that are carbon positive, if you will. They actually um, are, are sources that are um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas positive in terms of uh, the uh, sequestration of carbon and uh, sort of the any way effect that if you just left that biomass there, it would still release carbon as it decayed. Um, the July rulemaking we remain committed to, uh, it will almost certainly move to uh, ensure that biomass sources do not fall subject to greenhouse gas regulation while we, com while we complete that study. Biomass resources don't fall. What do you mean by that? Don't become subject to regulation. Oh, under in other words, uh, what you're saying is that the assumptions are likely to presume that sustainably harvested biomass resources will be likely to be considered biomass neutral. I mean well, carbon neutral. It, it will defer. It will defer for three years to allow us to complete the study. But what we wanted to ensure didn't happen is that biomass sources yeah not become regulated while we have time to get the science to um, make further determinations. So it, it's intended to be a deferral so biomass sources will not be regulated come July. But, but at this time you're not in a position then to talk about any assumptions that might be brought to that study involving the three-year deferral, if you will. Uh, no, I can, I can say, Mr. Bass, that I, I, we would not have gone so far as to propose a deferral to invest in the study had we not agreed that uh, some sources are most certainly going to turn out to be um, uh, carbon neutral and uh, that there may be some sources that are of concern, but we believe that there's a good chance that many sources are not at all a concern. I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to continue to communicate with you on this and to, to assure my interest, of obviously, is to assure that in a state where there's no gas, no coal, no oil, we have a little sunlight in the summer and quite a lot of wind, we need to make sure that in, the, that in America our uh, biomass resources are, to the extent it's at all possible and, and appropriate, that they're um, considered carbon neutral and a renewable energy resource, and I thank you for your for your uh, Thank you. attention to that. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Cassidy of Louisiana. Hello, fellow Louisianians. Hello, Mr. Cassidy. Nice to have you here. And thank you for being so patient with us. Uh, because we're both from Louisiana, you'll be familiar with this. Region 6, um, Chairman Barton brought up in the past. Louisiana, Baton Rouge has been under a non-attainment order for maybe three to five years, even though we've achieved attainment three years ago. Now I have here that um, we have been in the eight hour ozone standard for over three years. Um, and this has been communicated to Region 6 that apparently two of the five criteria to be designated attainment area have been fulfilled, but that we can't get a decision on the other three. Now, these were submitted in 5905, 122005, all the way up until last year. Now, it apparently is Region 6, because I have documentation here that the other regions are processing these sorts of requests to transition from non-attainment to attainment, 
in half the time or less. Uh, most recently, uh, we were told that we, our decision would be published in the Federal Register on February the 25th, and all that was published was that there's going to be another, list, uh, I guess, public comment period. And so it's kind of like waiting for Godot. It never happens, you know I mean? And in the meantime, of course, Mr. Pallone, my colleague, was concerned about jobs. We have industry which cannot expand because we are non-attainment. That's what I'm told. That um, uh, projects that could convert to cheaper feedstock are not taking place. Products to produce new grades of products at the request of customers on short deadlines are not happening. Um, products to increase production on a unit by small amount with minimal process changes are not happening with the jobs that are going with them. Now, frankly, when you say that you need more money because otherwise there's going to be a delay in the permit, I have to say, based on our experience in Region 6, it doesn't matter how much money you have. Clearly, ERA bumped up your funding tremendously because we're still not getting our stuff processed and there's been a cost in jobs. Now, I guess that's a twofold question. What's happening in Region 6? Why, can't, why are we just always being told, wait just a little bit longer and it never happens? And secondly, that's what gives your agency a bad name. People do their best to fulfill the regulations, and it just never happens. So your comments. Uh, I can't comment specifically on the uh, SIP, although I'm happy to look into it and make sure our staffs follow up from my office. If you uh, would, please. Yeah, I and think uh, that's probably we'll give you a, we'll give you a copy of the letter, and by unanimous request, I will submit a copy for the record. Okay. Uh, secondly, oh my gosh, you and I are so concerned about the oil spill. When I looked through your budget, though, I recall one of the issues is that EPA had not allowed there to be a test spill in the past. They had done that off the coast of Norway, taking I think 500 barrels down to 500 feet, released it, and saw what happened. Uh, and so when the spill happened in the Gulf of Mexico, we were ill-prepared, and obviously, although we had approved dispersants, we had had no real-time study of the effect of such. I don't see in your budget any research as regards that now. Is that in there and I just didn't see it? I believe we have $2 million uh, for uh, research on dispersants that we uh, achieved through another piece of legislation, sir. So, so we don't we have a... D for this year. We're spending it this year. Okay. Next, um, the uh, Gulf of Mexico, you mentioned that in your budget as one of the areas that you have concern, and laudably there is increased funding for the R Mississippi River Basin, but there is like tremendous cut for the Gulf of Mexico. So I see you're uh, on, a, on a presidential commission to address the environmental issues, but yet Lake Pontchartrain is losing 500 million. Gulf of Mexico is, I think, losing 1.5 billion. If you assume people's priorities are where they put their money, it doesn't seem like there's a heck of a lot of priority uh, of that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I certainly understand, and having grown up in the shadow of Lake Pontchartrain, a beautiful water body made incredible progress in uh, cleaning itself up. The commission and the foundation have done a wonderful job. Uh, we certainly continue to support them. Our work on the Gulf Coast uh, Task Force uh, with the president, we just had a meeting in New Orleans to talk about cleanup opportunities. Now, with all the money that's um, obviously in the Gulf Coast region from uh, penalties, from, from Clean Water Act penalties, et cetera. Would you support channeling, since there's a cutback in the federal support and since the Gulf of Mexico is obviously hit, would you support directing that money towards the states most affected by the oil spill? Uh, the president has said that he supports a significant amount of the penalties from the BP oil spill being returned back to uh, the Gulf Coast region. So Thank you, Mr. Administrator. I yield back. The gentleman now yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Gilbray, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me say, uh, as a, uh, somebody who married a young lady from uh, New Orleans, uh, a block uptown from Don Malisi's. Oh, nice. Spent a lot of time at, uh, um, over there with the Zephyr back when it was still operating. But let me, let me suggest one thing. When you talk about this issue that no one wanted to risk, um, putting oil in the environment and thus doing testing on it. The, the Gulf of Guinea has plenty of places that we could test, and we've talked about that before. You've got more oil spills happening in one area than all the rest of the world combined, and there should be a great opportunity for international. And I know at the Science Committee we raise this issue. You don't have to do it there. Why don't you go over and work with the international effort? Uh, what is the cost for greenhouse management or greenhouse reduction in this year's proposed budget? 
Uh, the president's proposed budget, I believe, has $202 million. I'll confirm uh, that in a moment. For climate change uh, altogether. Of now, are you planning on the next 10 years, basically, that being a flat level, or are you talking about increasing? Uh, we, we haven't. Uh, I don't think the president's budget speaks to uh, a 10-year forecast for that figure. So. But you can pretty well predict that, that at least that would be maintained over the next decade? No, I, I, I can't say that, sir. Okay, then let me ask you this. What is the, what is the um, percentage of reduction that you're projecting with this 200 um, investment? Well, I do believe that we will need to invest in greenhouse gas science, research, permitting. Some of that money is for states uh, for permitting issues as well. What is your, what I'm asking is if you implement this, what is the reduction that you are planning on getting within the decade on with these strategies at this cost annually? Uh, I see. Uh, in greenhouse gas emissions, yes. you mean. Yes. I'm sorry. I thought you meant budget. I'm, I apologize. Um, we, uh, we estimate that we can make moderate re uh, reductions in greenhouse gas, but primarily we can't estimate what, what is the, what moderate, what is your I term moderate? I can't estimate it, sir, because the rulemaking, the rulemaking uh, has yet to be proposed, sir. It's not going to come out until July. The only rulemaking for greenhouse gas is that wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I know that when we promulgate a rule, there's a target, and there are, the, the whole rule is designed for, for hitting certain targets. That's one of the great breakthroughs of the Clean Air Act was it was outcome-based. Are you saying that we do not have a projected reduction within the uh, decade with the, the um, uh, plan that has been proposed by EPA? Only because the rules have yet to be proposed. We, pr we finalized rules for cars. That's a million tons of greenhouse gas pollution. That's the okay, but so the low-lying no. fruit is the stationary sources, but you don't have a projection right now. Is it, will it be can you give me any idea at all, 5 percent, 10 percent, 20 percent? We are in the middle of listening sessions around the country on the rules that we would propose. In okay, ma ma Madam Administrator, I really have a problem with you're giving us a price tag, but you're not even willing to give us a target of the benefit of the price B tag. Business would not like me to sit here and tell them. I'm not asking about business. Rules. I'm asking about cost effect, what, what we're going to give the American people for what's being projected. And this is just the government expense, but you cannot tell me that what you're proposing to spend, you can't tell me even a ballpark figure of what the reductions are going to be, where the benefit is. Because let me tell you something, when we do ozone reduction, we go after toxic emissions, when we go after dioxin, we, we basically project, here's the cost, here's the benefit, here on um, the reduction, and here's the benefit in health. You're telling me with this strategy, we don't even have a ballpark figure? No, no, no. I'm telling you that as we develop the rules, we will be happy to put out what the ballpark figure is. In other words, give you, the money, the give you the money first, and then you'll tell us what the, what the in other words, pay the price and tell us what the, the, the product's going to be. No, 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 sir. The money goes, among other things, to helping us develop those rules, to have the listening session, okay. to be uh, able to make uh, informed rules. I, I have a real problem with that, and let me just tell you something. I, I, I don't think that at the ARB, we would, w staff, would ever be given a budget, at least if there wasn't a projection of the problem, the answer, and what the benefit was. Let me quickly say one thing. You, you brought up an issue about, do you believe that um, secondary sewage mandate should be universally applied in this country? Secondary treatment for sewage? Yeah, the activated slug um, secondary mandate under the Clean Water Act. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we are required under the Clean Water Act to do secondary. Are you required to mandate it even if science tells you otherwise? Uh, the regulations currently in effect mandate it. I suppose if science tells us otherwise. Okay, I just want to say, I want to put a plug in. California has the National Academy of Science and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography that has said not only the implementation of the Clean Water Act's secondary mandate at the San Diego outfall will not only not benefit, will be adversely impacted. And that finding was so clear that EPA and the County of San Diego's Health Department sued EPA, um, Cali. They, 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 I mean the, the, the um, Sierra Club and the, um, and the local health department sued EPA to stop a mandate that is in theory good but the ability, and let me just tell you, 20 years later, we're still going through that. And my question is this, if science tells you not to implement a reg, does that have the same weight as science telling you you should implement a reg? Science is science, sir. We should follow science. I absolutely agree with that. I do know that there's still a problem uh, with the San Diego outfall in water quality. And what's the, what's the problem? 
I, I do believe that there are still water quality concerns. Let, well, let me tell you what the water quality concerns are, is Mexico is being allowed to dump into our non-point source a federally owned flight control Gentlemen channel, time and that expired. is the major water quality problem in the area. It's a federal responsibility. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Administrator Jackson, for your time today. I wanted to follow up on a, a conversation that, that is uh, disturbing to me because I'm uh, troubled by the misrepresentation that you have made regarding uh, statements by, by, made by our chairman and the misunderstanding of the legislation that's currently moving through this committee. We've argued before and accurately uh, that the regulations that the EPA is currently proposing will drive gas prices up even further. The reports that I have seen on previous carbon legislation, carbon greenhouse gas legislation, show that gas prices in my district alone will increase by over 60 cents a gallon. That's as a result of greenhouse gas legislation. We know that your proposals will increase the price of fuel, of gasoline. We've heard it from the refiners. We've heard it time and time again from witnesses in this committee. A major reason for this is because your proposed regulations will hit those refiners, which convert oil to gasoline. If we drive up costs for refiners, we drive up costs to consumers. It's as simple as that. We can have a debate about whether the regulatory threat from your agency has already chilled investment, and I think it probably has, but no one can argue that impending regulations will not affect those refiners. And I'd also like to point out that your, 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 your point that you're comparing and mixing apples to oranges in your comments about the effect of EPA regulations on those gas prices. The car rule that you mentioned uh, for model years 2012 through 2016 has not increased gasoline prices. I agree, they have not. No one said they did. That is why our legislation expressly and clearly preserves this rule and makes it the law. Like it or not, this rule is in place and we believe it is imperative to maintain certainty for auto manufacturers. Our legislative experts agree that the car rule is preserved in the bill. If you have a different legal opinion, we can certainly discuss it, but let's not attack the individuals or question the integrity of individuals on this committee. Thank you. Uh, are you going to let me respond, Mr. Gardner? I would like to ask a couple of questions regarding uh, may EPA I re policy. May I, respond? may I respond, Mr. Gardner? I, would, I think you've made your position clear. And uh, again, may I, think I respond, please? Time is the, the time is the gentleman's from Colorado, the, the, so the gentleman may proceed. Administrator uh, Jackson, deserve some Madam money. Administrator, Madam Administrator, the time is a member of Congress, is the gentleman from Colorado, and he, he may proceed on his time. Thank you, Administrator Jackson. Um, earlier in front of this committee, you testified that uh, there are tremendous opportunities in rural America for the economy to continue to grow as it has thrived over the past several years. Further, you said that rural America's economy has done fairly well as the rest of the country has seen the housing market and economy really do poorly. 17 mostly rural counties in my state of Colorado have seen a population decline according to the 2010 census. With population decline comes economic decline, and my question is, do you believe that rural America is in a position to absorb the costs associated with the EPA's proposal to regulate greenhouse gases? Sir, EPA's regulations on greenhouse gases uh, have not impacted rural America to date, and any EPA regulations that come out uh, will will be uh, they won't impact public. rural Colorado. I, I did not say there will be no impact, sir. There will be a cost analysis that will explain how those regulations might impact any American, including rural co Colorado. How much of your budget is currently set aside? You have about two hundred nineteen point five million dollars for climate change. How much of that is set aside for economic impact benefit, or excuse me, economic cost benefit analysis? I'm happy to get you uh, uh, details of how the budget deals with economic impact. Um, going to the state revolving fund for drinking water, a couple of years ago, funding was tied to uh, certain wage requirements that has increased the cost of local water projects. Uh, I was wondering if you knew uh, whether or not the state, what, what total costs uh, have increased by state water projects as a result of uh, the language on wage requirements. Uh, I, I don't have any estimate of that, sir. Is there any way the EPA would provide what it's cost around the country in terms of increased cost to local water projects? I, I don't know if we have it. If we have it, I'm happy to provide the data, but I can't do that study if we don't have it. Okay, anyway, you could ask the people who've received funding through the state revolving fund uh, what their costs have increased as a result of that requirement? Um, I, I don't know if we have the authority to do an information request like that, but if we have the data, I'm happy to get it. In Colorado, we saw tremendous cost increases as a result of those requirements on the state revolving fund. 
uh, some increased by as much as 20 to 25 percent. Uh, and I would like to see that information, what it cost around this country. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Seeing no, seeing no other members, the uh, hearing is now adjourned. Mr. Chairman, I know they're, well. Uh, with the chair reminds members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record. To the chair, chairman, your compliance is appreciated. Thank you, Madam Administrator.